Good morning to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It is now Monday, the 17th day of May, 2021, and I am in Amarillo, Texas. What am I doing here when we're talking about hurricanes? Well, I will give you that information in just a few minutes. But first, it's the hurricane part of hurricane outlook and discussion. After all, it is mid-May, and the National Hurricane Center is doing their tropical weather outlooks again for both the North Atlantic Basin and the Eastern Pacific. So we do this uh, roughly every day. I'm traveling right now, so uh, this video discussion may be intermittent, and there's not a lot to talk about in the world of the tropics at the moment. Other weather is going to dominate the news, I think, for the next few days. But nevertheless, it's almost hurricane season, or it's kind of hurricane season, depending on how you look at it. And here I am. So let's get on with it, because we do have a lot to talk about First, just a real quick look at climatology. This time of year, we really don't see much happening, and that's for a good reason, because it takes time for the pot to boil, so to speak. You know that. Water temperatures, you know, they're warming up, but that's not the only ingredient. And so we can go back through the Hurricane Center's archives, and we see how things progress over the weeks and months to come. But right now, in the mid part of May, and we can look at these individually, you typically don't see much activity. The first 10 days of the month, May 1st to the 10th there, just a couple of areas here uh, in that time frame. And I hope they update this soon. It only goes out to 2015. I'm going to write a couple of friends of mine down there at the Hurricane Center and ask them, you know, who does that? Do you need me to volunteer to punch in some coordinates for you? I don't mind doing so. We can update your database. But nevertheless, going back to 1851 through 2015, only a couple of areas down there in the Caribbean and none in the Eastern Pacific. We move through around this time frame, May 11th through the 20th, and we're kind of smack in the middle of that here on the 17th, towards the tail end of that time period anyway. Yes, there are a few other areas of development, and you could certainly go in and add a few more in here since 2015. I mean, just last year, uh, at this very time, I was headed to the Outer Banks for Tropical Storm Arthur. I might have already been out there. Can't remember. It's been it's been a year, a heck of a year at that. Uh, but we know that we have been adding some preseason storms over the last several years. So that database needs to get updated soon, I hope. But you get the idea. It starts to pick up just a little bit through this third of the month. And then finally, the last third of the month, the Eastern Pacific typically gets busy relatively speaking and then there's a few areas in the Atlantic Basin but May is typically not a very busy month and it owes to the fact that yes we're watching water temperatures in the uh, Atlantic sides you know still warming they're warm enough here in the eastern Pacific usually but it's just the overall pattern there's a lot more in the way of upper level winds that cut across from troughs dry air all around this area uh, it's just really interesting that Central America and Mexico here divides the two basins, and yet it's over here in the Eastern Pacific where things are the busiest early on in the hurricane season. So it's quiet now, and it's meant to be that way. And that's a good thing, because you know what's probably coming once we get especially to August and beyond. Let's enjoy it while it's quiet now. Um, on my updates each week, uh, especially when we're waiting for the hurricane season to get going and we're looking at all these preseason, uh, as I kind of refer to them, keys to the game. One of those is the SOI, the Southern Oscillation Index, broadly related to the background to Enso State, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. And again, the Bureau of Meteorology and all the folks down in Australia that watch this over the many, many decades, hundreds of years, they keep track of this because it affects the grasslands the farming, their water supply, a lot of things related to it. So they're very involved and in tune with, with pressure patterns. It's important for them in the land down under. So this SOI, this index, is key to that. And when it's positive, like we see it over the last 30 days, compared to where we were in April and March, this is a pretty big jump. Will it last? That's what we'll talk about going forward. But anyway, it's positive 7 over the last 30 days. Today's contributor is a fairly respectable plus 9. And even the 90-day average has crept up a little bit. That's this index line right here. Uh, the 30-day, the red line, much more rapid because it's a shorter span of statistics. 
So interesting that the SOI uh, is rising. I typically relate that to the possibility that maybe this region of the Pacific would cool some more because a high SOI tends to create stronger trade winds blowing from east to west here across the equatorial Pacific if it's consistent. And that is the bottom line. Will the SOI remain in that positive mode where there's lower pressure in the Western Pacific than the Eastern Pacific, generally speaking, so that the net flow of air is west, or I'm sorry, east to west, and even maybe stronger than normal, stronger trades than normal. If you get that, it helps to drive that La Nina or cool neutral pattern, and very importantly, it does not promote El Nino. So let me reemphasize that when you see a positive SOI that is usually not a sign that you're heading towards a warm ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation event, whereby this part of the equatorial Pacific would warm. That's usually what we would expect. But then you see tweets like this uh, from TC Alert that I follow on Twitter. It's a high schooler. You're like, Mark, come on, man. You're 50 years old. You're following a high school kid on Twitter. You bet, because some of these people they're on top of it. They know what they're looking at. They're going to be up and coming meteorologists one day or something related. There's a lot of good stuff on social media. You just have to know where to look and pay attention to where you pay attention. So anyway, that being said, and I, I do, I like giving credit where credit is due. And you know, this may be a high schooler that's a weather enthusiast, uh, primarily interested in the tropics, but I take notice at what they are saying. So here's the tweet. While a La Nina no longer exist per the Climate Prediction Center, the movement or even the intensification of the Madden-Julian Oscillation into the Western Pacific would be the death sentence to remnant cool anomalies. And what is meant by that is the favorable Madden-Julian Oscillation way over here off the edge of the map would typically create rising motion and maybe even westerly winds coming this way across the tropical Pacific. It's an oversimplification of it, what I'm showing you here, that these anomalies through here would start to moderate and maybe become warmer. But one of the keys to that, I need to see these numbers begin to drop. As the MJO sets up over the Westpac, we would expect the daily contributor to plummet and then start to drag down the 30 and the 90 day once again. So you see, it's all kind of interrelated. So we'll see what that ha uh, how that unfolds there, that tweet from uh, TC Alert. Uh, here's the different phase diagrams of the strengthening Madden-Julian oscillation, all these little plots in here, and the area of the ensemble members, the envelope. Yes, strongly favoring the Westpac. And also this is interesting because it's not favoring phases 8, 1, or 2. You can clearly see that it's headed around towards the Western Pacific. And so this means generally that the Atlantic Basin, the Western Hemisphere towards Africa, would not be favored for any kind of tropical development over the next couple of weeks. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but that window of favorability is generally closed for the time being. So see, everything's connected. Interesting stuff there. Thanks for that tweet. I'm glad that that high schooler is paying attention. So it helps us. Helps me, gives me some graphics that I can show. All right, so we already looked at this for the East uh, Pacific, the West Pacific, all that, the Inso region. What about the Atlantic? Generally, a little bit warmer than average through the main development region, much above average water temperatures here in the subtropics. How will that play into the hurricane season? Well, we're gonna have to just wait and see. Kind of overall, the signal still remains positive, at least in terms of favoring and when I say positive, I don't mean that you want hurricanes to come. Uh, you get what I'm saying. The favorability for a big hurricane season remains on the table. I saw another a tweet today uh, on Storm 2K that was referenced um, about a favorable look from the JMA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, for a favorable upward motion pattern uh, across Africa, the Indian Ocean, spitting out those tropical waves into the Atlantic once we get to August, September, October. So I don't see any changes in that whatsoever. All right, so moving on here, 
at the satellite animation courtesy of Tropical Tidbits. Nice and dry convection-wise throughout the Caribbean, the tropical Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. You can even see these strong upper-level winds cutting through here. Very easy to pick those out just by checking out the cirrus clouds, those upper-level clouds. No organized convection in the eastern Pacific either. Most of the energy right now is up here over the nation's midsection in the lower 48 weather portion of what we'll discuss, and we'll get to that in a moment. But yes, things are generally quiet, uh, again, as they should be. And look at the shear. I hadn't shown this in a while, but here's the shear map. Uh, we use blue to outline what's what. Here's the east coast of the U.S. There's Florida, just kind of outlining it quickly for you. All this red through here, strong upper level winds, as I showed you on the satellite animation, and the shear analysis here from the University of Wisconsin, their Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies, confirms that. So there you go. All right, headed to the beach anytime soon. Well, water temperatures gradually going up. Now about 21 Celsius along my neck of the woods of North Carolina, South Carolina. Warmer in the Gulf Stream as you would expect. It's getting there. Water temps trying to come up. Hey, you know what? The good news, I've been reading from some of the other folks on Twitter that a huge bubble of high pressure, a big what we call heat dome, is going to develop over the eastern part of the country over the next few days, and that will help to warm up these water temperatures rapidly, a couple degrees, which is pretty quick if it happens within a week or so. And as we approach Memorial Day, when you head to the beach, it'll be better than it is now, put it that way. Gulf of Mexico continuing to warm as well, as you would expect. If it wasn't, I think we'd be in bigger trouble than if we had hurricanes to deal with because that's the natural cycle of things. You know, we just have to adapt and be aware is the way I look at it. Don't fear the hurricanes, learn about them, be ready for them, and you know, you'll have that edge. But yep, water temperature is going up. There's the 26 Celsius line. So pretty much everything else down here ready for hurricanes to develop. But as we said earlier, it's not just warm water temps. You have to have upper level winds that are favorable, some kind of pre-existing seedling, and a whole bunch of other things, and those are just not in place yet. What is in place, moving to lower 48 weather, is this right here, this moderate risk, overall severe weather pattern favorable in the great state of Texas, and that is why I am here. I have this big interest in using our hurricane technology, the unmanned cameras, the weather balloon that we have, our drones, things like that, to document severe weather in a way that is different than what other people are doing. You're very aware of all of the different projects out there from people like Reed Timmer and even the late great Tim Samaras and his son and the work that they did putting probes out. You know, I don't really have much that I can contribute to the tornado science. There's a lot of people doing a lot of great things from individuals like I just mentioned to the NSSL, the National Severe Storms Lab, Different, you know, OU has programs with their mesonet across Oklahoma. There's a lot already going on, but what I want to do is try to use video as a data source, just like we do in hurricanes. A, it is very visually appealing to be able to see what's going on in real time with live video, but also the idea of capturing in the highest resolution possible supercell structure how that works on wide angle, close up, anything in between. I think there's a lot that we can gain by the use of video, not just for sensational tweets and YouTube hits or whatever. Look, all that's well and good, but at the end of the day, how does it affect the science? What can we learn from that video? It's exciting to track storms, absolutely. There's an adrenaline part to it, yes, but I wanna to contribute to the science if I can. And so that's why we're using some of our hurricane tech out here in the alley. And look, 10%, you know, that's, that's not, you think, well, 90% chance there won't be a tornado. Some of these supercells that are going to form today will produce tornadoes. It's just a matter of who and where. And you have to understand that that's the area of 10% or greater probability of EF2 through EF5 tornadoes within 25 miles of a point. It's not 10% that they might happen at all, 
you got to understand what all of this means. And so we do, we being the people I'm working with in the background, as well as my partner Brent that came up from the Virgin Islands to help me out. We get it, and that's why we're here. The wind threat, oh man, we're going to have some strong winds with this. Power outages, uh, impacts to the energy generating wind farms out here, you name it. That's going to be a problem, as will the gorilla hail. And boy, have I seen people like Reed Timmer talking about this, you know, bigger than your fist hail, uh, like a gorilla pounding you, right? I guess that's where the term comes from. And we have a couple of really neat GoPro cameras that we've set up and a little project that I'm going to just wait and see if it works. And I'll show you about it. I'll show you what it is tomorrow if we get the results we want. I want to keep it on the DL because I think it's pretty cool, a way to show you the hail like you've never seen it before. So stay tuned to that. But yes, the big hail is going to be a problem um, for this area. People are used to it. Yes, it's not like it's unusual, but it still sucks when it busts a hole in your roof or messes up your car or your crops or your equipment. So that's why you have to be aware. And people out here are generally on top of it. They know what's coming. All right. Also, looking at the National Weather Prediction Center, used to be the Hydro Meteorological Prediction Center, but I guess National Weather Prediction Center, or the Weather Prediction Center is easier to say. Um, a lot of flooding issues coming up, moderate risk of flooding on the day three. That's nothing to take lightly. Even the day two, uh, eight hours ago they issued this. Please check these guys out, guys and gals that work there. Um, it's out of Washington, D.C. I do, oh, College Park, Maryland, close enough. That's where they're located. Follow these folks on Twitter, on the actual web, uh, at that address you see there, wpc.ncep.noaa.gov. Easy for me to say, but there's the link. Really important. It's not just the, you know, jaw-dropping pictures of supercells and tornadoes and hail, but the flooding is a big problem. So I, I highly recommend you follow this page and their social media stuff, all right? So again, I'm up here in Amarillo after one heck of a day yesterday. Brent and I were out across this region tracking storms, amazing structure, unbelievable lightning last night, even um, pretty good almost ping pong ball size hail that we saw as we got ready uh, for you know, what's going to happen today and what will happen. Well, I don't know for sure, but we are going to head down to Lubbock and then get down here to I-20 over towards Abilene and set up cameras across this area ahead of time as well as a couple of weather sensors, these Kestrel sensors that we've got, to try to be ahead of the storms early across basically this area, right through here, set up a little bit of a network, spike strip, fence, whatever you want to call it, to document what happens not only with live cameras pre-positioned, but to be able to rapidly set up GoPro cams, even a 360 cam, and one live cam, we've got the vehicle cam too, in front of a supercell, get out of the way so we don't get the truck beat up and see what we capture. I think it can be really neat if we can put the drone up safely and park it for about 20 minutes and see the rotation of the supercell. That could be cool as well. I want to do something different. There's a lot of people that are going to be out here trying to stand out and do something that's interesting and innovative and unique. And I think we got a couple of good ideas. We will be streaming live on our public YouTube feed. Uh, right here on YouTube, so if you're not a subscriber to the YouTube channel, might as well do it now. Hit the notification bell so that you are notified when I'm streaming live. The vehicle cam always made available to the public, but all of our unmanned cams and the behind the scenes stuff, that's to the people that fund what we do. Patreon.com slash hurricane track if you want to join the crowdfunding effort through Patreon. Download the Patreon app or go to Patreon website and search hurricane track. It's easy, or the link in the description uh, in today's video, and you can join in the behind-the-scenes part on Hurricane Track Insider of all the stuff going on. CJ will be anchoring the coverage later today from Florida. we got a good operation here, and you guys help to make it possible through Patreon. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. Hurricane Track is the brand, and I appreciate you following along. All right, well, like I said, we'll have the vehicle cam. Let me just pop up on here one more time so I can talk to you and not at you. I will have the vehicle cam going here in the next little while, probably within the hour or so of you watching this video, depending on when you watch it, I guess. It's 11 o'clock, uh, what is it, Central Time, 
So I better shut up and get out of here. But yeah, within the hour, by about noon central time, live vehicle cam going, and we'll have coverage of what we're doing here in Texas, and we'll see what happens. All right? Have a good rest of your Monday. Thanks, as always, for tuning in and giving me a watch and a listen. I am Mark Suddeth. I'll be back with you probably tomorrow with an update on what we got done today and another uh, quick look at the tropics. I'll talk to you then.